The next item of business is a debate on motion 17191 in the name of Monica Lennon on urgent support for Scotland's midwives. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. And can I say at the outset that this is a very tight debate, so please keep to time. And I call on Monica Lennon to speak to and move the motion for up to seven minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On Sunday, it was International Day of the Midwife, and I enjoyed seeing my social media feeds filled with lots of cute baby photos and lovely sentiments about the special work that midwives do in supporting women and their babies. And the baby theme has continued with the Earl and Countess of Dumbarton announcing the safe arrival of their little one on Monday. And I'm sure the Chamber wishes Meghan and Harry all the best. All babies are special and Scottish Labour shares the ambition of the Scottish Government to give all children in Scotland the very best start in life. That is why we've called this debate today, seeking urgent support for Scotland's midwives, because we believe they need extra help to keep delivering excellent care for women and babies. Before I say more about this, I'd like to pay tribute to the Royal College of Midwives and thank them for their input. And also like to thank Unison and many of my own constituents who have shared their experiences of midwifery and neonatal care and their ideas for innovation and improvement. This morning, I had the pleasure of visiting University Hospital Wishaw with Richard Leonard, where we listened to midwives telling us with great pride and passion about their work. We heard about the highs and the lows, and I was very struck in particular by the care that has gone into developing dedicated bereavement and baby loss support. We met midwives who wake up in the morning wanting to make a difference, and that's exactly what they are doing. So I want to thank NHS Lanarkshire for allowing us to visit and for creating a supportive environment where midwives like Lorna Lennox, who's developed this beautiful ribbon, which I know you can't, can't read, but it's got a very um, helpful guide for mums who might be unsure about baby movements and so on, and it promotes the, the triage service. But these are the lovely little touches and innovations that we're seeing when staff are uh, truly supported. The work of a midwife, however, is clearly demanding. And their jobs are made more challenging than they should be because of workforce pressures. Last year, there were 127 whole-time equivalent vacancies in Scotland. And of these, 45.5 posts were left unfilled for longer than three months. Overall, the vacancy rate has increased from 1.3% in 2013 to 5% in 2018. These vacancies put additional pressure on the rest of the workforce. Our midwifery workforce is highly experienced, and that's a good thing. But over 40% of midwives are aged over 50. Their knowledge and experience is invaluable. However, the ageing workforce also gives rise to concern about succession planning as midwives start to retire. And this was an issue we picked up um, on today during our visit in Lanarkshire and more widely in conversations with the Royal College of Midwives. Despite falling birth rates, midwives' workloads are not diminishing and we need a robust pipeline of midwives for the future. There are between 50,000 and 60,000 births in Scotland each year. There has been an increase in complex births due to a number of inductions of labour, a rise in the number of older women and women with a high BMI becoming pregnant and giving birth. And this brings me to resources. I was worried to read a letter signed by community midwives at NHS Lothian who describe not having enough equipment, computers or pool cars. And I expect Lothian colleagues like Miles Briggs and Alison Johnson and Alex Cole Hamilton um, will share this concern. And I hope today the Minister will commit the Scottish Government to carrying out an investigation. 19 Lothian midwives signed this letter and they say that the understaffed and stretched service relies on midwives' goodwill to meet the growing caseloads and ever-broadening remits. Midwives, like all of our NHS staff, deserve to be treated with respect and care, but weaknesses in workforce planning is contributing to reports of burnout and stress. And it's our job here in Parliament to have an honest conversation about how to fix this. If colleagues support the Scottish Labour motion today, we will all agree that low morale, bullying and work-related stress must be urgently addressed. Scottish Labour broadly welcomes the Scottish Government's Best Start strategy. The continuity of carer throughout the maternity journey is valued by women. And if adequately resourced, can improve outcomes in maternity and neonatal care. 
We pay tribute to NHS staff and service users and organisations, including Bliss and the National Childbirth Trust, who influenced the final strategy. We are pleased to see the Scottish Government's motion um, or amendment rather, emphasise that the £12 million allocated to Best Start is an initial investment. But we hear the concerns of midwives who are anxious to see further resourcing follow quickly. And that is why we are calling for an additional £10 million to be released towards the Best Start rollout. In conclusion, presiding officer, Best Start reforms, if adequately funded, could be transformative and lead to successful outcomes for women, babies and their families. Midwives do such an important special job and they must feel valued. Pregnancy is a treasured time, but it can be challenging. And it is imperative that all women receive the care that is right for them. We will happily support Miles Briggs's amendment recognising the positive work of the Royal College of Midwives. And I'm grateful that the Scottish Government amendment does not delete my substantial points around workforce pressures and the need for an urgent investigation into the resourcing concerns in Lothian. I do note that the Scottish Government has removed our call for an additional £10 million, which makes it difficult for me to support the amendment. But I look forward to clarification from the Minister about the funding that the Scottish Government will make available when she gets to her feet. Presiding officer, the Scottish Labour welcomes the reforms the Scottish Government is taking forward. What we do believe is certainty of funding is essential. I move the, mo the motion in my name. I now call Claire Hockey to speak to and move Amendment 17191.2 for five minutes, please, Minister. Thank you very much, President Officer, and I move the amendment in my name. Um, I thank Monica Lennon for highlighting International Day of the Midwife. In Scotland, we're very fortunate to have highly educated, skilled and compassionate midwives who lead and deliver the high-quality care so valued by women and their families during their pregnancy as they prepare for the birth and their first few precious days and weeks with their baby. Our midwives support the whole family and that matters because all the evidence tells us that the experience in the early years can make a real difference to health and well-being later on in life and support for new parents needs to start pre-birth. So let me repeat the thanks that Jean Freeman recorded on Sunday on the International Day of the Midwife to every single midwife in Scotland and every young midwife in training to thank them for their commitment, compassion and dedication to their role. It's two years since the Best Start, a five-year forward plan for maternity and neonatal care in Scotland was published. The Best Start describes a new model of maternity and neonatal care that is family-centred, focuses on compassion and the best care, with the whole family involved in this experience. And one of the central pillars of the Best Start is the introduction of continuity of midwifery carer. Under this model, women receive most of their care from a primary midwife and a small team through their pregnancy, labour and birth and afterwards. That's what women told the Best Start review that they wanted. Midwives told us this is how they want to work. And this model is supported by compelling international evidence of its positive impact, including improved satisfaction with care, fewer medical interventions during birth, improved breastfeeding rates and reductions in preterm birth and baby loss. Last year, five early adopter boards were identified and they were given the task of leading the way across Scotland in implementing the new model of continuity of carer and local delivery of care. And the first teams are now delivering continuity of care to local women. Capturing and sharing learning from these early adopters is helping the remaining boards plan for change in their own areas, tailored to their own local needs. And the underlying principle of delivering individualised care built around a woman, her family, circumstances and needs will be at the centre of every midwife's practice. Built into the model is the recognition that some women with complex needs will need extra care and the midwife's caseloads are reduced to give them the time to provide that care. We know that the rollout of continuity of carer and the delivery of the range of recommendations in the Best Start will need investment to deliver. And that's why Jean Freeman announced a funding package of £12 million over two years for implementation across the Best Start programme. This has allowed boards to invest in infrastructure and in training and equipment to make the Best Start a reality. And we are looking at future funding, recognising that rollout will take several years. 
No one is in any doubt that this model will mean substantial changes to ways of working, particularly for midwives. And that's why our early implementer boards have invested time and energy in communications and change management, supported by our Best Start programme board and delivery groups. We expect all boards to roll out the new model in a planned and managed way, with safety at the forefront, and our maternity teams are working hard to deliver this. In addition, boards have been supported by national groups that have developed a range of guidance frameworks and training for staff to support implementation. To ro support rollout, the Best Start programme executive team and the RCM are engaging with the early adopter boards and listening to their experience of continuity of care to identify learning at a national and a local level to improve implementation across Scotland. A Best Start event in March was attended by over 200 maternity staff, mainly midwives, from across Scotland, with many more watching on the live stream of the event. And the event focused on sharing learning and experience of rollout of Best Start, including continuity of carer, and giving staff the opportunity to ask questions. Um, if you wish to, Minister yep. Kezia Dugdale. Yes, I'll take Officer, I wonder if the Minister would recognise the role of midwives in providing postnatal contraception for women, particularly in poorer communities, and if she does, can she tell us how she ensures that that money goes to deprived communities to do that crucial work? Uh, sorry, Minister, I believe I shouted Kezia Dugdale instead of Monica Lennon. Would you like to take them both and deal with them? <laughs> do I have time? <laughs> I'll give you time. Monica Lennon. Um, thank you, President Officer. Thank you to the Minister for, for giving way. Um, I appreciate the, the explanation we've had from the Minister so far about future funding. In the amendment, I'm struck by the word if the plans will be successful, if fully and appropriately resourced. What I'm not hearing from the government is an absolute commitment that they will be fully and appropriately resourced. And that's why mm. we've put down that reference to £10 million, which stakeholders tell us would give them some confidence. So I wonder if the Minister can give me and the Chamber some further assurance on that point. Claire Hawkey. Uh, thank you, Monica Lennon and Kezia Dugdale for both their interventions. If I can take them in turn, I certainly uh, echo and support what, what you say there, Ms Dugdale. I think it's very important that we ensure that women are able to plan their pregnancies and do that in a safe and manageable way. And that's why we have, um, obviously, uh, free contraception in this country. And it's very important that midwives play a role in educating women about their fertility, particularly in the postnatal period. Um, as, as regards uh, Ms Lennon's intervention, the, te the £12 million is an initial investment in the four uh, early adopter sites. And we anticipate that there will be additional um, monies coming to uh, the other boards. But we also need to recognise that, that this is not an addition to the current midwifery care. This will be transformational. This will become the new normal of maternity delivery of care. Yeah, I know and that if you the vast, could wind up now, please. I know minister. that the vast majority of midwives and maternity professionals and key stakeholders, such as the Royal College of Midwives, the National Childbirth Trust and Bliss, support the introduction of continuity of care. An introduction of this model is important in terms of satisfaction for women, staff and staff, and from the perspective of improved outcomes. But change in this scale is difficult and challenging, as change always will. We, we know that it's important to listen to those staff on the ground and to learn from what's working well, and to work with boards and help them to manage the change programme in the best way forward. And uh, if I could also add... Uh, no, please, also, Minister, I think we're running out of time. No and again, can I give my apologies to all for that uh, error I made? And I now call on Miles Briggs to speak to and move Amendment 17191.1. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I very much welcome the opportunity to debate Scotland's midwives and maternity services today and thank the Labour Party for bringing this forward. And let me start by echoing Monica Lennon's comments about the dedication, expertise and skills of our fantastic midwives who offer world-class levels of care to mothers, babies and families across our country. Their contribution to our health service is massive and we owe them a great deal of gratitude for the work they do every single day. And I also would like to pay tribute to the excellent work of the Royal College of Midwives and hope members uh, will support my amendment in my name on recognising uh, their work and campaigns. 
I share the concerns that have been already been voiced about the very significant midwifery workforce challenges that are affecting so many of our hospitals and communities. The latest statistics show 114 mid midwife vacancies across Scotland and the vacancy rate for midwives has doubled over the last five years. There are fewer midwives in post and, than five years ago and less than 30% of nursing and midwifery staff now feel there are enough staff. It's therefore little wonder that the RCN accused the First Minister while she was Health Secretary of a spectacular error of judgment when she cut the number of nurse training places. Now, all of this is an indictment on the SNP's running of our health services and failure to put in place adequate national workforce planning for the last 12 years they have been in office. The midwifery shortage is another example of just how damaging the health secretary, Nicola Sturgeon's training place. Uh, very shortly. Yep. Claire Hockey. But the members should be aware that we have more qualified nurses and midwives working in our NHS, up by 7.9%, a new record high. Uh, it's up to over 44,000 full-time equivalents. Our nursing and midwifery student intake is up 7.6%, the seventh successive rise. And this par during this um, parliament... I, th I think, Minister, um, you're very limited in time. You're still Thank only you. up Let to four minutes. The, the key statistic I think the Minister needs to understand, if we have, we have a shortage of 114 midwives today and the pressure that's putting on staff across our country. Now, the government's attempts to rewrite history in their motion does not recognise that NHS workforce challenges are this government's responsibility with our, with our midwifery workforce ageing. A large proportion of Scotland's current midwives are now over 50. Extra midwifery student places should have been provided. Now, instead of the damaging cuts to training places which the First Minister uh, made to ex exacerbate the current staffing problem, as one of Edinburgh's uh, MSPs and a Lothian MSP, I agree with Monica Lennon that the open letter midwives across uh, NHS Lothian have written is deeply concerning. It should concern ministers as well. When they raise the shortage of key equipment, it should be urgently addressed by NHS Lothian, something I hope the Minister will take these concerns forward on as well. Now, the Best Start recommendations were widely welcomed by stakeholders and experts, and Scottish Conservatives back their focus on patient and family-centred approaches. We agree that there needs to be a continuity, continuity of care for a mother throughout and beyond pregnancy. And it's up to SNP ministers to make sure that all required funding is delivered to implement Best Start. In regards to support for new mothers here in my own region in Lothian, I've highlighted recently cu cuts to walk-in specialist breastfeeding services, uh, which took place in 2017. Since then, we, I've been regularly contacted by mothers who don't know uh, where to turn when they're having problems breastfeeding. Now, I welcome the recruitment of more health visitors by NHS Lothian. However, if a new mother is having troubles in breastfeeding here in Lothian, they benefit from support straight away. That's why I'm proposing the introduction of a dedicated telephone line for new mothers to phone if they're having issues with breastfeeding, allowing them to get the instant support whenever uh, these difficulties arise. To conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, I again welcome today's debate on maternity services and midwives. I'm pleased to support Monica Lennon's motion and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. And I call Alison Johnson. Four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome today's debate and thank Monica Lennon for bringing this issue to Parliament. And I too would like to thank Scotland's midwives for the incredible work that they do. There is agreement in both the motion and the amendment on the importance of the continuity of carer. The 2016 Cochrane Review found that the midwifery continuity of carer model made women more likely to have a normal birth. The Best Start recommendations recognise that all women should have continuity of midwifery carer from a primary midwife. This gives midwives a real chance to get to know mothers and families, taking individual circumstances into account. And this is key. This relationship provides an opportunity to ensure that every growing family in Scotland who requires expert advice on or help on financial and other matters get the help that they are entitled to. Um, midwives are ideally placed to identify families at risk of falling into child poverty at the earliest stage, but of course they require the capacity and the resources to have the time to do so. It must be acknowledged that there have been serious concerns expressed about whether the Best Start recommendations can be implemented with current staffing levels. In December last year, there were over 114 vacant midwifery posts in Scotland, and there has been a year-on-year -year increase in these vacancies since 2015. Now, these serious concerns have been described clearly in the open letter referred to in the motion from midwives in Lothian. 
Now, I recognise that the government is taking steps to address issues around capacity. They have increased the number of training places and they've increased the student bursary. I, I welcome that and I'm optimistic that the Health and Care Staffing Bill will help ensure appropriate staffing levels. But these measures alone won't solve the problem. There are, as we've heard, concerns about retention as more than a third of midwives are over 50. There is consistently a significant proportion of the midwifery workforce that is aged over 55 and could therefore retire at any time. That is a lot of invaluable experience that will be lost. And it means that new midwives are dealing with complex cases without that backup and support that is essential. Now, the birth rate is falling in Scotland, but the demand for midwives is growing. This is due, as we've heard, to a rise in older women and women with a high BMI accessing maternity services and requiring more complex care. According to the Royal College of Midwives, more than half of women accessing maternity services are now obese or overweight. We know that there's a well-established link between deprivation and obesity. Healthier mothers reduce midwife workload and maximising the income of pregnant women is one way we can tackle the strain on midwifery services. In 2017, the Greens secured a commitment from the Scottish Government to roll out the Healthier Wealthier Children Scheme across Scotland. I'm keen that we don't lose momentum on this and will continue to monitor progress of the rollout. Midwives and other antenatal service staff and health visitors have played, and others have played a huge part in the scheme this far and I'd like to offer my thanks for their hard work. Uh, Miles Briggs was right to, to highlight the impact of community-based projects such as the Pregnancy and Parents Centre in my own region. They help parents have the healthiest pregnancy possible and they provide invaluable support to pregnant women and mothers, which in turn eases the strain on midwives. But cuts to services are undermining this. In Lothian, as we've heard, vital face-to-face -face help for breastfeeding mothers has been slashed by 60%. Five weekly half-day specialist breastfeeding clinics in community centres were shut in December 2017. I'd like the Minister to respond to these concerns in closing. That would be very helpful because no one, you know, imagine having to wait for a week you must worrying close, that you'll be unable to feed your baby. Um, presiding officer, I will close, but it is imperative that we do all we can to properly fund and resource midwifery services. Thank you. Alex Cole Hamilton, four minutes. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Really grateful to the Labour Party for uh, bringing this debate to Parliament today, assure them of our support and coming as it does, just uh, hot on the heels of International uh, Midwives Day. Um, I can't think of another uh, healthcare professional other than GPs with, with whom every member of this chamber has had some association, usually on the first day of their life, but many have had subsequent interactions with midwives in the birth of their own children. And it was at uh, 6 p.m. on Palm Sunday five years ago that my wife went into labor with our third child. And the first two labors with our boys had been uh, protracted over a period of days, so we thought we had quite a lot of time. I took a leisurely trip out to Dalkeith to drop the boys uh, with uh, Granny um, and discovered to my horror when I was on the bypass that Jill was timing contractions as two minutes apart so we realized things were moving apace uh, got her into the car and back onto the bypass at which point she went into transition which is quite a terrifying thing when you're driving at 70 miles an hour um, and it, it, my wife insisted I phone the midwife at, uh, at the, the Royal Infirmary um, and they talked us in and I actually said we we're coming in hot and I can't park this car I need to dump this car at the door this baby is coming now um, and sure enough, they said, that's fine, just pull up outside the door. And when we did pull out outside the door, there were three midwives ready and waiting for us uh, right there. Um, one of whom, I, it turns out, I went to school with, and she told me that as I got out of the car, and she said, but that's not important right now because your wife is about to have a baby. Um, and sure enough, 11 minutes between doorway and delivery, we were delivered of Darcy, our, our third child, and she was happy and healthy and uh, well cared for. And we were carried in those 11 minutes on very confident hands, and we had an excellent experience. And I know that is replicated um, in hospitals around this country every single day. So um, the profession have our are great thanks. It's always easy to think of midwives in hospital settings, but they do so much in our communities as well. And I think that, you know, my party make a, a great deal about the need for more adequate perinatal mental health support services. We forget that it is midwives who pick up the first signs of postnatal depression or other mental health difficulties associated with childbirth. That is an absolutely key issue to be addressed in terms of the first days, those early days, and the best start in life for our children. But more than that, 
We've asked with subsequent policy developments for midwives to do more with less. For example, they are the first named person any child will get in their first days of life. It will be the midwife who is the named person until that's handed over to the, the health visitor. But again, like Best Start, it's a policy initiative that midwives were not involved in the creation of. And I think that is a serious misstep. We are asking them to do more with less. And I, by less, I refer to the point that's been made several times in this debate of the calamitous decision taken by the then Health Secretary and now First Minister Nicola Sturgeon to cut training places by a fifth. That's 300 places lost to the profession. And there is no doubt of the causality and the causal relationship between that myopic decision, that cut to training places, and the subsequent 5% increase to 5% vacancy rate that we see today. So I, in closing, presiding officer, I just want to thank the Labour Party. We'll be supporting the Labour Party motion, absolutely. We'll reject the government's uh, amendment because I think it glosses over some of the problems that the Labour Party rightly bring rise to. And we're happy to support the Conservatives today. It's important we have more debates like this, though, because I think that midwives are often forgotten about. They are... Um, more than just healthcare professionals. They offer counsel, succor, crucial advice in those first sleep-deprived days of early parenthood, which we all rely on. And we often forget just how much of a good start they don't just give our children, but each of us as new parents as well. Thank you. Thank you. I call David Stewart to be followed by Emma Harper. <clears throat> uh, thank you, President Officer. The International Confederation of Midwives created the concept of the International Day of the Midwife, which previous speakers referred to. But the theme this year across the world is midwives, uh, defenders of women's rights. Now, of course, the organization has a strong international message, but it's also applicable to Scotland here and now, that midwives uphold and protect the rights of women every day, that midwives need safe and enabling environments to work in, and that women have the right to make choices about their care during childbirth. It's a truism that's often worth repeating, that maternity and neonatal care are crucial to the health and well-being of Scotland's people. As the Scottish Government's own report on Best Start said last year, and I quote, services have largely developed over time, rather than being designed around the needs of women and families, leading to different approaches and care across Scotland. And as previous speakers have said, we all know that the birth rate in Scotland has been falling. But of course, the work for midwives is not dropping proportionately because of increased levels of birth complexities, more inductions and a rise, as we've heard from Alison Johnston and others, in older women uh, uh, and women with very raised BMIs becoming pregnant. But that means that there are changing needs in the population. Services need to change and develop and with them because some are no longer fit for purpose. My colleague, Rhoda Grant, will provide a case study shortly uh, based around case nest. And I know from my own experience, along with others in the chamber today as convener of the cross-party group in diabetes, that long-term conditions such as obesity and mental health problems need a strong proactive response from health services. Now, health inequalities is a concept that I've referred to many times in this chamber and in the Health and Sport Committee. We all know that women from disadvantaged communities face particular challenges during pregnancy and birth. And Best Heart has a number of key principles to address the problems that I've just raised, such as continuity of carer, particular focus in rural areas, for example, linking up transport services, enhancing telehealth and telemedicine, and along with wider targets, like a single maternity network with a single neonatal clinical network for Scotland. But is it working? Well, one midwife working in Glasgow who I got feedback about from Best Start said today, I just can't see how it can work safely for both women and midwives. We're being failed as it is. Completely rewriting the system won't fix that. Honestly, this is a hot topic at work, and people are so scared of this. But we all know that midwives are the front line of the NHS, bringing new life into the world, and a job that's both beautiful and heartbreaking, hard and beautiful as well. So there, that's... It's so much so, uh, there's a feeling that some have no choice but to leave the job they love. Tell us something of what must be done. Now, we've already heard from a colleague, Monica Lennon. We believe that we need, from this side of the chamber, transformational change to midwifery. But it's crucial this is not done on the cheap. And we all know uh, that existing midwifery workforce are already under significant pressures with high level of vacancies and increasingly complex cases to manage. 
In addition, the 2018 State of the Workforce report from the Royal College of Midwives found that the number of midwifery vacancies quadrupled over the past five years. I would echo previous speakers who called for an urgent investigation into the concerns raised by the midwives from NHS Lothian, who believe they do not have the resources needed to deliver the new models of care. The skills and commitments of Scottish midwives need to be recognised and celebrated today. Let's ensure that all midwives have the time, the training and the resources to do their job properly. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Emma Harper to be followed by Annie Wills. Emma. Thank you, presiding officer. I chose to speak in this debate today because it is a, a real concern for me that uh, to read this motion presented by the Labour Party. I too acknowledge that May the 5th was an international day of the midwife and I would like to provide my thanks to all our incredibly skilled midwives across Scotland. I was an active clinical educator who used to participate in education sessions for midwives dealing with complex um, case issues which has been highlighted by Alison Johnston because obese uh, patients had no venous access so I had to look at supporting them to work with central venous access which is something completely unfamiliar if you're a nurse or, a, or if you're a midwife and NHS of Risa Galloway in my South Scotland region as with other areas across Scotland has its challenges with midwifery services and this is something that I have been in communication with the local midwives and NHS and Friesen Galloway board about. I would like to focus my contribution of course, I will take an intervention from my colleague, Finlay Carson. Uh, I, Finley declare, I, I firstly declare an interest in being a father in the next 12 days, but does the member agree with me that despite the incredible hard work of the midwives in Wigtonshire, they're being badly let down by previous decisions from this government because there's only two midwives covering the whole of Wigtonshire and there's the impending closure of the birthing unit in Stranraer, not down to improvements in the service, but down to concerns around safe and resilient staffing levels which will require women in Shinrar to have to travel 70 miles to Dumfries. Emma Harper. I absolutely agree, Mr Carson. There are real challenges in Dumfries and Galloway. We had a, a midwife charge nurse um, uh, die, and actually we had one retire. So there's major recruitment challenges. And I actually am coming to the 75 miles of potholes that uh, Labour Women, women in labour do have to experience when they're moving from there. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in disagreement with you, but I would concur that there are, there are challenges, and I'm coming on to that. Um, presiding officer, when I read the motion put forward for the debate, I referred to, I've just referred to recent casework that I've done, but at the end of 2018, I wrote to NHS Dumfries and Galloway to highlight these concerns that have been communicated to me by constituent midwives. And I wrote to the head of midwifery and I asked about the challenges that were perceived by the midwives, because it's not just about recruitment and training, there have been morale issues that have been highlighted as well. And I raised the issue with the Clenach birthing suite, which I have just responded to, about Galloway Community Hospital as well. And in response to my letter, I was pleased to read that the head of midwifery has met with a representative sample of midwives across the area, from Stranraer to Dumfries, to speak to them about morale, about the challenges they faced, and overall how they felt. And these meetings were based on modules of conversation from the Good Conversation Programme, and allowed the midwives to rate their feelings on how their morale, their experience, was and most of the midwives rated that the service delivery was seven out of ten which means that it's a satisfactory standard but it is worth noting that no midwife that was asked felt that staff staff morale was an issue but that was a bit of a conflict in what i have conveyed but i would like to raise one issue about the NMC has declared that there has been a reduction of 13% of midwives registering from our European neighbour countries, and Brexit has been cited as a cause of this. And I would like to just quickly highlight that the Scottish Government is keeping the bursary, is supporting uh, free tuition, which has been taken away south of the border. So the Scottish Government is in investing and I commend that so I would like to hear any further information from the Scottish Government about how we can support our midwives in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much Ms Harper. And I call Annie Wells to be followed by Joe McAlpine. Thank you presiding officer. Midwives play an essential role in the NHS. 
and many women who have given birth will remember the names, if not faces, of the midwives that took care of them on one of the most important days of their lives. I certainly remember all the help and support I got as a 21-year-old first-time mum, hundreds of miles away from my family. The support I received before, during and after giving birth was greatly appreciated, and particularly the emotional support, which you can't put a price on. It's so important that we give midwives our full support so that they can work in an environment that helps them and the vital work they do. International Day of, of the Midwife, which was first celebrated in 1991 and, as we've heard, took place on Sunday, acts as an opportunity to celebrate and advocate for many ways that the midwives support women. Midwives have, over the past two decades, rolled with the changes in both technology and society. More women than ever are getting pregnant via IVF, and more women are having children later in life. Patient satisfaction with maternity services is high, with 74% saying their care in labour was excellent, and 61% saying the same for antenatal care. This is not to say, however, that we are doing right by midwives who are facing pressures on a daily basis. And as we've heard from my colleague Miles Briggs, statistics show there is a current shortage of midwives, with 114 vacancies across Scotland and fewer in the post and fewer in post than five years ago. In a Scottish Government staff experience report, only 27% of nursing and midwifery staff said they felt they were in, there were enough staff to allow them to do their job. We know this is a long-term issue across the NHS workforce. In 2016, Audit Scotland highlighted a lack of workforce planning in health boards. So as well as the issue of recruitment, retainment is also a huge problem. Two years ago, the former head of the Royal College of Midwives put on record her concerns about an ageing workforce. The proportion of midwives aged 50 or older jumped from 34% in March 2013 to 40% in March 2018. She also stated that workforce behaviours were deterring trained midwives from staying in the profession. There have, been, there, there have been reports, as we've heard, of low morale, bullying and work-related stress. A Royal College of Midwives survey found over half of RCM members had experienced harassment, bullying or abuse from service users or their families in the last 12 months, and a third reported being on the receiving end of this from a manager. And whilst midwife, midwife unions have supported Best Start, they have expressed concerns about how it will be implemented. There is widespread concerns about the demands of being on call and the potential impact this will have on work-life balance. That is why today we've put forward an amendment highlighting the work undertaken by the RCM to improve workplace culture. Given that a study last year found strong links in Scotland between the quality of maternity care and women's health, health, health after childbirth, it's all the more important that we get the necessary support in place. Presiding officer, I want to finish today by again thanking midwives across Scotland who do such a cracking job. They are one of the most visible and valued professions working in our hospitals and communities and to that end deserve our full support. We must look to improving workplace culture and creating an environment that supports the vital work midwives do. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Joe McAlpine to be followed by Rula Grant. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to speak in this debate today, highlighting the vital work of midwives. And I wanted to open by paying tribute to one very special midwife, um, my children's grandmother, May Kane, who died a few weeks ago in her late 80s. Excuse me. May was an old school midwife who, between the 1950s and the 1990s, delivered thousands of babies across Coatbridge and Lanarkshire, including, I believe, one of our own parliamentarians, Elaine Smith. Um, many of these babies were amongst the mourners, as adults of course, who came to say goodbye to me a few weeks ago uh, in Coatbridge and demonstrated the esteem with which she was held uh, in our community and indeed the high regard in which midwives are held. And uh, the priest actually said that many of them hadn't 
Some of the younger ones hadn't met her, but they knew that her hands had brought them into the world, and that's why they wanted to be there. Um, and I think it's fitting to put that record um, of her name into the Scottish Parliament. She often spoke of the importance of one-to-one -one care and the close relationship between mothers and midwives. And of course, that's exactly how she operated back in the 1950s and 60s when she set off on foot to homes uh, whenever she was needed, often very poor homes, which she then followed up with a lot of aftercare. And she would have been the first to welcome the fresh focus on continuity of care which has been outlined by the Minister today. So I'm paying tribute to her and, of course, to all the nurses and midwives uh, whose contribution of such critical importance to the NHS and should be valued and celebrated. Uh, and I'm proud that since the SNP came into office, there are now more qualified nurses and midwives working in the NHS and Scotland's staffing levels are up to a record high with qualified nurses and midwives up 7.9%. Uh, and I welcome the fact that over this Parliament, the Scottish Government will continue to invest in education and training support with £40 million worth of investment allocated to create up to 2,600 extra nursing and midwifery training places. In addition to increasing places for new students to the profession, the Scottish Government also introduced the Return to Practice programme, which provides funding for encouraging former nurses and midwives back into the profession and understand that almost 460 uh, have retrained on the programme since 2015. The Scottish Government is also funding the Open University to deliver a pre-registration programme currently supporting uh, 116 nursing uh, students. And as well as increasing places for new students, the Scottish Government will invest 11 million to expand the available financial support for nursing and midwifery students. And I think this is particularly important. All eligible students in nursing and midwifery courses across Scotland will benefit from an increased bursary in 2019-20, rising from 10,000 a year, uh, rising to 10,000 a year in 2021. The core nursing and midwifery student bursary has been set at 6,578 per year since 2009-10, and is increasing to 8,100 uh, pounds in 2019-20. These bursaries are the best in the UK uh, and they're neither means tested nor repayable. The announcement made by the First Minister in October has been welcomed by experts and key organisations like Glasgow Caledonian University, one of the largest providers of nursing education in Scotland. Uh, an additional discretionary fund of at least one million was launched in 2016 to provide a safety net for nursing and midwifery students in financial difficulty. This is in sharp contrast, of course, to the UK government's position in England, where both the bursary and free nursing and midwifery tuition have been scrapped. These measures taken by the SNP government to both improve and safeguard the integrity of the NHS in Scotland demonstrates very clearly um, that the Scottish Government will deliver the best possible framework for continued support for both nurses and midwives employed in the health service, as well as students who will be the next generation to provide world-class care and support for millions of new Scots. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Rhoda Grant to be followed by Edward Mountain. Rhoda Grant. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. We've heard this afternoon that the relationship between a family and their midwife is incredibly important. Best start lays out best practice and what we should expect from maternity services. And our motion highlights that this is underfunded. And as you read the report, it becomes more and more obvious that that's the case. It talks about multidisciplinary teams and communities following the mother and family through the stages of pregnancy, birth and beyond. However, in Caithness, only 10% of births take place in the county. The rest take place in Inverness over 100 miles south over treacherous roads. A similar situation arose at Dr Grace Hospital in Elgin, and this is slightly improved due to interim paediatric cover. However, this cover can't be guaranteed and the situation remains precarious with around 60% of births still taking place in Aberdeen. In Caithness, there was no attempt to provide paediatric cover. Previously, there had been obstetric cover, but no paediatrician. A baby tragically died, and it may have been that had there been paediatric cover available, that could have been prevented. Instead of addressing the lack of paediatric cover, obstetric cover was also removed. 
the argument being that having obstetric cover give a false sense of security and mothers were not transferred to Rigmore quickly enough. There was also an argument that midwives were being de-skilled and birth was being over-medicalised. However, with only 10% of the births now taking place in the county, it's difficult to see how midwives can hone their skills under the new system. The truth is um, that distances are so great, clinical staff transfer the mum if there's any concern over the birth, and I don't blame them because they don't have backup locally. If during a pregnancy there is thought to be complications or risks, many mums opt to have elective cesarean sections. And this is the only way that they can plan when they will be away from home and organise childcare for older children and indeed organise for their families. And sadly, this is even greater medicalisation of birth. And as with all major surgery, there are risks attached. This flies in the face of what Best Start states and it says nothing about giving birth in the back of an ambulance. I raised already in Parliament the case of a mum who gave birth to one of her twins en route to Inverness. These twins were born in different counties, 50 miles apart. How distressing and how unsafe. If it is unsafe to give birth to a child in Caithness Maternity Unit, it is surely much more unsafe to give birth at Galsby Community Hospital, which does not have a maternity unit or facilities. The first twin then travelled separate from its mother to Inverness. Its mother travelled in another ambulance and gave birth to the second twin in Inverness. NHS Highland has not risk assessed the journey and I fear a tragedy will occur before they do. If the Scottish Government are committed to best start, they need to address this. Another point of concern is that the journey home is the journey home with a newborn baby, a long three hour journey by bus or four and a half by train and at least two and a half by car. Caithness Health Action Team discovered that it was dangerous for a newborn baby to travel such long distances in car seats. For the journey home to Caithness, a journey of that length, there should be specialist baby cots to allow the child to lie during that journey. This is something that surely would have been picked up had NHS Highland carried out a risk assessment into the new pathway. The community then had to raise funds and purchase the appropriate travel cots and Tesco stepped in to offer to store them for the families when the NHS refused to do so. The truth is that the current practice does not reflect what is pro proposed in Best Start. It's unacceptable for both parent and midwife. I ask that a risk assessment is urgently carried out into the current practice at Caithness. Whether that is a physical journey to hospital or back home or the large increase in elective cesarean sections, the whole patient journey needs to be safe. Thank you. And I call Edward Mountain to be followed by Sandra White. Edward Mountain. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And it's always uh, a pleasure to follow Reda Grant, who has said most of what I wanted to say in my speech. But it, it, is, is, to, it is so good that we agree. I'm delighted we're holding this debate to, to acknowledge the International Day of the Midwife and also to champion the hard work and devotion of all midwives across Scotland. I'd like to begin by celebrating the passion and dedication of our Highland midw with midwives, which was brought to national attention on the BBC television series. I'm also pleased to see the first cohort of midwifery students enrol at the University of the Highlands and Islands this January. This is a groundbreaking course which will equip, will equip new recruits with the skills to provide care in remote and rural Scotland. Where progress is being made, we should definitely celebrate it. However, we should not forget that under this Scottish Government, not all is well with our health service. I believe our midwives are being let down by the poor-term long planning that has seen serious staffing shortages. We have fewer full-time midwives in post than we did five years ago. Our health service is experiencing the devastating effects of the First Minister's decision to drastically cut the number of training places for nurses and midwives between 2009 and 2012. The SNP's efforts to repair the damage they have caused is not inspiring confidence of the health professions, professionals either. The Royal College of Nurses have criticised the SNP plan for its lack of detail and for admitting how much money will be invested in growing the nursing workforce. 
This frankly isn't good enough. And I believe it shows a lack of seriousness about resolving a workforce problem that the SNP themselves have created. What we need is for the SNP government to finally and fully support our hard-working midwives. What we don't need is more of the ill-judged approach to saving money by downgrading local maternity services. When I attended the NHS Highland, I, I'll just keep, make, make a little headway and then surely. When I attended the NHS Highland's annual review, it was clear that the centralisation of services to Ragmore Hospital and maternity provision in Caithness remain very big concerns across the whole region. Presiding officer, I'll give way to Emma Harper. Emma Harper. Thank you for taking that intervention. Does the member agree that the, level, the number of births might be an indication of why it's difficult to maintain a, a, a small birthing unit open? Like Stranraer last year had less than 20 births. So that's a challenge to maintain a midwife's level of competence in order to provide the safest care. Edward Mountain. In, indeed I will, and I'm just coming on to that. For too long, I believe our senior leaders in NHS Highland have held the belief that centralisation is the solution to all of the problems. But downgrading services like Caithness and the one that the member mentions at Stanra is simply not the answer. You talk about lack of births being carried out in Caithness General. Well, here's a fact for you. There were 219 births last year by Caithness mothers. 18, 18 were born at Caithness General. Numbers like that are of huge concern to families wanting to have children in Caithness, many whom would prefer to give birth locally and avoid the long, stressful journeys south to Inverness that Rhoda Grants has mentioned. And they certainly don't expect to make that journey when they're in labour. Centralisation is not working for new families. And, that, and all this puts intolerable pressures on staff Pressures made even worse by the alleged bullying in NHS Highland that we are now seeing talked about in other areas across Scotland. Presiding officer, our midwives deserves better than this Scottish government is currently giving them. Whether it's cutting training places, staff source shortages, or the deep problems with workplace culture, we need to do more for the midwives that are so critical to the future of Scotland. Presiding officer. Thank you, Nicole. Sandra White. Thank you very much, President Officer. Um, can I also join with others in the thanking uh, the midwives, our midwives, uh, for the work that they do and the care that they give before and after birth uh, is very, very precious to all. And obviously, things are changing constantly. Um, it wasn't yesterday when I had my three kids, so I know that things do change along. And I think things have improved immensely in regards to that. Now, I've listened to a number of people quote the figures of midwives and older midwives. And I accept that, that we need more people and there are being more midwives and nurses put forward for training. Uh, but I think we should actually get together and congratulate the midwives who are here at 50, 55, 60 years of age. They may have to work to their 66 under the new, obviously, what's happening from Westminster. So I know that we do need it and I accept it, but I think we should congratulate them. Lots of these midwives, I think Monica Lennon had mentioned in her opening remarks, bring huge amounts of experience with them as well. So we should be congratulating the fact that our midwives are there, regardless of what age they are. So I just wanted to say that, presiding officer. I want to concentrate on the best start, uh, the, the forward planning, uh, the plan that's there. It's been mentioned by Monica Lennon, the Minister, and I think numerous others as well. And I think, if we're being honest with each other, we look at that as a very ambitious plan. And it's a very honest plan as well. When you look at what actually has taken place, I think the Minister went through the whole thing, so I'm not going to go through it. I've only got four minutes anyway. But when you look at the review that they went through, you look at the engagement, who was actually engaged in there, and you look at the key recommendations, I think that's taking out to not just the local communities, but the professionals as well, and what they want to see. As I said, I don't want to go through the whole thing, so I may just mention some of the recommendations and actually who actually took part in this review. Uh, the workforce took part in it, 
14 NHS territorial boards took part in it. That's quite a huge, huge, you know, undertaking in that respect, and 600 staff engaged in it. Now, it is ambitious, as I say, but it is honest, the review, and 600 staff took place, it took it part in that, and I think that says something for engaging with your staff. 504 responses to the National Experience Survey, that's something, and 2,000 2,000 women shared their experience of care, the Scottish Maternity Care Experience Survey 2015. Now, I think that shows you that the government is working. We may have a lot of work to do, and as I said, I'm being honest about, about the actual report. It has some very, very honest recommendations there, but for 2,000 women to be able to share their experiences and that put into a report, I think that's something that we put the way forward. And I do, you know, I think... Oh, sorry, Monica Lennon, I'll let you in. <laughs> Monica Lennon. Thank you, to Sandra White. I agree that that engagement has been really, really important. But does the member agree with me that the, the certainty we're looking for is around the funding now for the next phase? And the word if in the government amendment does give some uh, pause for concern? Sandra White. I suppose it's the way you read the amendment, but I think uh, the minister's reply and her contribution, I don't think that if gives as much concern as perhaps is being read into it. But I do say, as I said, I'm, I'm being very honest, and I think the report is very honest, that yes, we do need more monies to put forward in the care report and put forward for the services, but it will depend on how it pans out, and maybe that's where the if comes from. That's the way I'm reading it anyway. It might not be the way Monica Lennon reads it. But I think when you look at the review and you see how many people have took part in it, you're getting an honest answer from the staff from women, from the professionals, and from the health board as well. It might not make great reading to perhaps the government even, but it's honest, and we are replying to that in, in, in an honest way as well. And as Monica Lennon says, the if, I don't know, perhaps the minister might say that in her summing up or, or whatever, but uh, I'm quite confident that we will get there. It's ambitious, but we'll get there in the end. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much, Ms. White. And I call Brian Whittle to be followed by the Minister of Clare Hockey. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I first refer the members to my register of interest in that I have a daughter who is an NHS uh, midwife. And I also thank the Labour Party for bringing this debate to the Chamber, but in saying that, I have my disappointment in the short time we have to discuss this. I think there's so much I would like to say. Very early on in my time in this place, I started working with a constituent of mine, uh, Fraser Morton. Uh, Mr Morton and his partner, June, had gone through the unimaginable tragedy uh, of losing their son, Lucas, in childbirth. The circumstances leading up to the death of their son had troubled Mr Morton, and his, his response was to investigate. And he is a lecturer in health and safety. And it transpires that to add to their trauma, uh, Lucas's death was avoidable. Now, he asked me to go along with them to meetings with the Health Board, um, Health Improvement Scotland, and the investigation team. I've got to say I was shocked uh, at the way in which Mr Morton and his family were treated. Mr Morton was insistent that there was a real systemic problem, but there was, uh, a, but there was a consistent wall of denial. At one point, there was a suggestion that one of the midnight midwives would carry the can. And I have to say Mr Morton did resist that. In the end, I'd organised a meeting with the then Cabinet Secretary, Shona Robeson. Uh, he is a very knowledgeable and very well-informed uh, 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 individual, as I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary would have agreed and as would the Health and Sport Committee at which he gave evidence. The net result was a reluctant, uh, uh, I have to say less than satisfactory in our opinion, investigation by Health Improvement Scotland. However, that investigation uh, resulted in an extra 24 neonatal staff recruited into the department. 24, a uh, presiding officer. That must mean that the department was 24 staff short at that point. Not only does that speak to the patient safety and the high baby mortality rate at the time, but it must also speak to the pressure that the department was under being so chronically understaffed. Now, a commitment both in a meeting with Mr Morton and in the chamber was also made by Shona Robeson to make CTG scan training compulsory twice a year for all neonatal staff. Given that the misreading of CTG scans is cited in a high proportion of childbirth mortality cases, this was a very welcome step. And I have to say, I think Mr Morton has actually managed to achieve more than all of the, 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 the members in here combined over that period of time. The problem is, of course, that this is not being universally adhered to. And perhaps the minister could tell parents in the chamber how this policy is being implemented and how its implementation is being measured in his summing up. Edmund Mountain has been leading in the bullying culture in his local health board. And now we have another health board being accused of systematic bullying by almost 100 radiographers. 
claiming that staff have suffered years of bullying, harassment and victimisation. This is the very same hospital that these issues were raised by Mr Morton some three years ago. And I would ask the question, what has changed? Because bullying is a lack of respect and it is, being under, it is undervaluing the work that they do. Creating an environment where healthcare professionals want to work has to be a primary priority. There is this bullying and blame culture that has developed into this aversion to risk that is shutting down experiential learning. How can we learn the le lessons if the evidence is being swept under the carpet? There is claim after claim that the system is driven towards finding individual brain rather than looking at the flaws within the system itself. And I think until this issue is addressed, presiding officer, the chronic staff shortages, not only in midwifery, but across healthcare professional disciplines cannot be solved. So many midwives are taking early retirement because of their, they've seen their value and status eroded. I think it's retention of staff is what we're talking about, presiding officer. There is a hole in the bucket, cabinet secretary, and no matter how hard we try to fill that bucket with water, it will never be full. We need to fix the hole. Look after the health and well-being of our healthcare professionals if we want to retain our staff. I think this plays, uh, midwifery is a vocation, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Two of our shifts are commonplace and to add to pressures of understaffing and a culture of blame and staff bullying will not encourage our midwives to stay longer term. So, Presiding Officer, look after their well-being first and I think it's time the government understood this. Thank you. I call the Minister Claire Hockey. Presiding Officer, and thank you again to Monica Lennon for tabling the motion today highlighting the International Day of the Midwife for debate and for the comments from other members. And I also want to repeat my thanks for the incredible support midwives give to women and families and provide reassurance to midwives that we are listening to their concerns and taking them seriously. As a close, I wanted to highlight some of the positive work that is going on in maternity services in Scotland. Maternal mental health is a key priority for me. It affects as many as one in five pregnant women and we know that it is underdiagnosed and that without the right treatment there can be serious long-term impacts on women and families. An investment of £50 million shows that we are determined to improve the recognition and treatment of perinatal mental health in this country, including improved community support, better access to psychological assessment and treatment and more specialist services for those with most severe illness. President Officer, I would like to uh, respond to some of the points raised in today's debate. Um, as regards the mention by some contributors to the Lothian Midwives Open Letter, NHS Lothian have their first pilot team as part of their phased approach to implementation with safety at its core. And the board report positive feedback on the new model and have confirmed that all midwives have their own equipment, including laptops, in the pilot team. And I know that senior staff at NHS Lothian met with midwives who contributed to the letter to listen to their concerns. And further meetings, events and workshops are arranged with staff to explain the plans and listen to their concerns. And NHS Lothian have also established a staff group to feed into their Best Start programme board to allow staff to engage with and influence the Best Start agenda locally. Um, returning to some of the other points raised about uh, midwife numbers, I've heard the concerns expressed by some about the sustainability of the midwifery workforce. And we will continue to work closely with the RCM and other stakeholders to address this. The Scottish Government has supported a range of actions that are underway to address this, including a return to practice programme where 59 former midwives to date have <coughs> undertaken training, a shortened midwifery course for nurses in the north of Scotland, and a new programme where up to 100 retired nurses and midwives will train as professional practice advisors, sharing their knowledge, skills and experience with new recruits. And there has been a 99.2% increase in midwifery support staff since 2007. Under the SNP, a thousand more nurses and midwives are trained each year compared to the previous administration through the high, record high funding in our NHS. And we're seeking to increase our midwifery student intake in 2019-20 from 226 to 257 to meet the projected future requirements. NHS boards are also exploring a range of innovative approaches, for example, bringing retired midwives back on reduced hours contracts and one example of that being in NHS Lanarkshire who are bringing back 80% of their retiring midwives on 15 hour contracts. And finally I want to underline the ethos of collaboration driving the best start. <coughs> Recommendations were developed following the extensive consultation with over 600 staff and 600 women who fed their views into the process. 
and key stakeholders such as the RCM, the National Childbirth Trust and Bliss have been involved throughout. Continuity of care is the right thing to do for women, for families and for midwives. But I understand that many midwives in Scotland have never worked this way and that change is daunting. And that's why it's so important that boards work in partnership with their local maternity staff to ensure that they feel safe and supported during the transition. Reforming services is not easy, but we should not shy away from moving forward when we know it is the right thing to do. And that's why we have five early adopter boards leading the way in testing what this new model might look like for Scotland. Both the Best Start team and the RCM are well into a series of listening visits to understand how continuity of carer is being rolled out and hear any concerns. And we will use learning from these visits to inform the way forward for Scotland. This government is committed to the aspirations outlined in the Best Start and most importantly, to improve outcomes for women and their babies. Thank you very much, Minister. And I call on Monica Lennon to wind up our debate. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the, the motion has been really simple um, on our side. It's about an urgent review of the very serious issues that have been raised by not just one, but 19 midwives in Lothian who, who put their name to that letter. So I appreciate the Minister's giving some update, but the, the concerns that they raise go far deeper than just the, the best start reform. So we do need to see an urgent review. And we have asked for £10 million of funding to be brought forward uh, on top of the, the £12 million committed already. Because the, the word if in the, the amendment does give concern. I know Sandra White is feeling optimistic, but I think many of us are, are concerned. Um, it has been a, a short debate. I share Brian Whittle's frustration, but I think members have packed a lot in. We've had very considerate speeches. Um, there's been very constructive challenge. And I think there has been personal reflections from across the chamber which remind all of us how much we owe to Scotland's midwives. So consensus around the importance of midwives and the skills, education and love that they bring um, certainly exists. But we've heard about many of the challenges. Um, Emma uh, Harper and Finlay Carson as well as Edward Mountain and, and David Stewart and Rhoda Grant touched on some of the rural challenges and of course we heard about the importance of the, the road network too, so potholes are a real difficulty for, for women in labour, we heard. Um, Dave Stewart was telling me that his daughter Kirsty was the first baby to be born in Ragmore Hospital. So there's been lots of anecdotes Thank today you. and uh, I believe the Thank Royal you. Baby now has a name. Uh, so congratulations uh, Baby Archie and I'm sure that my colleague Jackie Bailey will be inviting um, the, uh, the, 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 the Duke and Countess of the Barton Earl, sorry, keep me right, keep me right. I'm not big on royal convention, but I'm sure they'll get an invite out to Jackie Bailey's constituency. Um, Annie Wells um, said that, that people remember their midwives. So when Richard Leonard and I went to the University um, Hospital of Wishaw today and met with fabulous midwives there, I had a, a lovely surprise where Ella uh, Sinton, who delivered my baby, Isabella, in 2006, is one of those midwives who is still on the job 38 years later, and um, she's doing fantastic work. Um, so it was lovely to be reunited with Ella, but Ella is one of the midwives who will be retiring in the next few years. And it is important that we, we do capture the knowledge and experience because we do need to grow that pipeline of new midwives coming in. And we don't want midwives feeling stressed and burnt out and affected by low morale because that will put people off and it's important that we all do what we can to make sure that uh, midwifery is, is attractive. Um, I do share the concerns of Tam Watterson who is the, the chairperson of the Scottish Health Committee at Unison and he said that any changes to the provision of midwifery services should not be at the cost of hard-working, dedicated midwives paying with the erosion of their terms and conditions. So I agree with Alison Johnson that continuity of carer is the right approach, but it has to be backed up by the, the right um, investment. Um, I know it's a very exciting topic for, for members, uh, presiding officer, and uh, maybe we're not seeing a picture of the, the royal baby yet, but this is hugely um, important. As I said, Richard Lind and I spent time um, in Wishaw with midwives this morning. They deal with some of the happiest occasions, but they also deal with some of the saddest occasions. And I can't think of anything sadder than the loss 
of a baby. We haven't really had a ch chance to mention some of the, the charities who support families and midwives, but Simba and uh, uh, Bliss and uh, uh, Sands, um, there's so many, but they do really, really important work. And I heard in Wishaw today that they're looking at ways that they can fund additional soundproofing, which might come in handy here in Parliament too, but soundproofing so that, that, that mothers are experiencing stillbirth and baby loss um, have you know the, the right conditions and I would like to think that we don't rely on just uh, charitable donations for that kind of work so aside from the, the reforms in Best Start there's a lot more that we can do I think there's wide consensus today for Scotland's midwives and our mums and babies um, I'm pleased we've had this good debate and I hope that members can support the Scottish Labour motion in my name this evening presiding officer <laughs> Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on urgent support for Scotland's midwives. The next item is consideration of business motion 17207 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a business programme. Could I ask Graham Day to move the motion? Move, presiding officer. Thanks very much. And no member wishes to speak against the motion or on the motion. The question, therefore, is that motion 17207 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau Motion 17208, an approval of an SSI. And again, could I ask Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau to move this motion? Move, presiding officer. Thank you. So we turn to decision time. The first question is that Amendment 17190.1 in the name of Derek Mackay, which seeks to amend Motion 17190 in the name of Colin Smith on Scotland's future, scrap the cut to the air departure tax, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 17190.1 in the name of Derek Mackay is yes, 64, no, 59. There are no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is that Amendment 17190.4 in the name of Jamie Green, who seeks to amend the motion in the name of Colin Smith, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 17190.4 in the name of Jamie Green is yes, 32, no, 91. There are no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that Motion 17190 in the name of Colin Smith as amended on Scotland's future scrap the cut to the air departure tax be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. Move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 17190 in the name of Colin Smith as amended is yes, 65, no, 58. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. The next question is that amendment 17191.2 in the name of Claire Hockey, 
which seeks to amend Motion 17191 in the name of Monica Lennon on urgent support for Scotland's midwives be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Or not agreed? We'll move to a vote. Members may cast the votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 17191.2 in the name of Clare Hockey is yes, 62, no, 61. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is that Amendment sorry, is that Amendment 17191.1 in the name of Miles Briggs, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Monica Lennon, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion. I wasn't doubting you, Mr. Briggs. The next question is that motion 17191 in the name of Monica Lennon, as amended on urgent support for Scotland's midwives, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 17191 in the name of Monica Lennon as amended is yes 92, no 26. There were five abstentions and the motion as amended is therefore agreed. And so our final question is that motion 17208 in the name of Graham Day as amended. No, no, as amended. And it's not the final question either. It is the final question. It is the final question, though, and it is on the approval of an SSI, motion 17208. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. Thank you very much. We're going to move now to members' business. Members' business in the name of Miles Briggs on Scotland and Nation of Lifesavers. We'll just take a few moments for members and the minister to change seats.